Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Just for the people that just joined, uh, I'll read out the bullets on this slide. Welcome to the Parsons TKO webinar around content accessibility. All participants' microphones have been muted and cameras have been turned off. Please post any questions in the chat and we will review them during our Q&A segment. This webinar is being recorded and will be distributed after the session. Panelists will restate their name before responses to accommodate all participants. Cart closed captioning and ASL interpretation are available. We are waiting on our ASL interpreter at the moment, so thank you for your patience. All right. Oops. So this webinar is making accessibility part of your content workflow. I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists um, in a second, but I wanted to talk a little bit about myself um, as the host of this webinar. Um, my name is John Harrison. I use pronouns he, him, and his. Um, I'm currently wearing thick rim glasses um, and a blue shirt with a, it looks dark blue actually, with a uh, white line around the collar, two buttons. Um, I'm currently working out of my home office in Richmond, Virginia. I work for Parsons TKO as a solutions producer. We help organizations with uh, digital transformation. What got me interested in content accessibility was uh, both as a practitioner of user experience design a few years ago, I got certified in UX back in 2015. Um, I learned a lot of things about accessibility at the time, um, but I think a personal event that happened to me in 2017 where I became visually impaired in my right eye um, really helped me gain empathy and learn about um, some of the things that I needed to do better with the content that I was promoting for the nonprofit that I worked at. It also gave me um, some empathy around the tools that I use to build content and publish content across websites, email and social media at the time. And uh, it's been an interest of mine. Um, I've been a practitioner of it for a little while. I'm not an expert in it, which is why I've invited this uh, renowned selection of panelists that we have here. So with that, I'd love to pass it over to Elaine K.A to introduce herself and give you some information about uh, her interest in content accessibility. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine K.A. My last, my full last name is Cubic Agrawal. It's just too long, so just go K.A. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I am a mixed Latina woman with dark hair and dark eyes. Uh, I have lived experience with depression and anxiety for several years. I'm currently the VP of Strategy and Communications at Disability In, which is a nonprofit uh, leading corporate disability inclusion and equality around the world. Uh, I was also the primary author of the UN Disability Inclusion Communications Guidelines, um, a really great foundational resource. And I'm joining from my home office in Brooklyn, New York. So thank you for inviting me to join. All right, I'd like to hand, this is John again, I'd like to hand it off to Sina. Hi everyone, thank you, John. Hi everyone, my name is Sina Patakel. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a junior associate at Current Global, which is a mid-sized PR agency that's part of the interpublic group of agencies. I'm a blind Indian woman with long black hair that's pulled into a ponytail today. Brown eye, I have brown eyes and medium brown skin. I'm wearing a pink floral blouse and I'm joining you from my home office in Philadelphia. So for me, as I mentioned before, I'm legally blind. I also have vertigo inducing migraines and my lived experience as a person with a disability, specifically a sensory disability has led me to pursue a career in communications to champion accessible communications. Um, I did my thesis in grad school at NYU, focusing on disability inclusive communications, which brought me to Current Global to champion 
its Accessible by Design initiative, which is our client offering and commitment to make every piece of content we create, curate, and publish accessible to audiences of all abilities by meeting the highest accessibility standards. And during my time there, I've supported them by creating our accessible communications guidelines, our 21 day challenge to teach people the fundamentals of accessible communications, as well as a new in depth hands on training for accessible communications. And now I'm going to hand it back to you, John. Thank you, Sina. I'd like to also introduce um, Conrad. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Conrad Furman. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I am the Chief Technology Officer at Future Man Digital, which is uh, what we say we do is we're the special ops of digital. You need something kind of crazy, we do it, uh, from video to experiential to uh, apps and web. Um, what really intrigues me with this panel and, and getting involved is that when I started my career 20 years ago, uh, there was nothing taught about accessibility, even though it was already there. Uh, and through my career, it has been always a secondary or tertiary items at best uh, to you know, discuss. So my initiative here at Future Man has strongly been to bring accessibility in from the very point of concept of a project when a client comes to us, make them aware of it and bring it through, through uh, uh, the end goal. Um, also, the one thing I missed, which I knew I was going to, is that I'm a white male in his 40s. Uh, I'm wearing an orange shirt, which clashes with the orange background uh, today. I did not think about that in advance. Uh, I do uh, wear glasses um, and do have a small visual uh, issue uh, with screens. Back to you, John. Thank you, Conrad, Stina, and Elaine. It's great to have you. So I want to give you all sort of a sense of um, the run of show for for today. So we're gonna we're gonna essentially take the webinar in three pieces. We're gonna talk first about what content accessibility is for a few minutes. Then we'll move into why it's important to do it in your organization. And then lastly, we'll talk about how you can do it. And as part of that, we'll talk about some resources that you can start using today or tomorrow um, to really move the needle forward in your organization around making more inclusive content. So let's, and we'll also have some time at the end for a Q&A, hopefully, if we can get through everything. We have a lot to talk about. So let's start with the what. Um, I'd like to ask this question to Elaine. What does content accessibility mean and what does it entail? And I know, Elaine, you've got a lot of fascinating um, facts and statistics to share. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, yeah, and actually I'll take a step back and talk about um, disability in general. Uh, you know, when, when I think about marketing and accessible marketing, uh, you know, I have a, a backbone. My entire career has been in marketing. It's only been in the last five years that I, I really dove into accessibility and accessible marketing. But for, with a marketer's hat on or communications hat, it's it's reaching your target market. And the reality is, is that uh, people with disabilities is as many as 1.8 billion people around the world. And in the United States, it's one in four of us. And at Disability Inn, we often talk about the proximity to disability. So even though you may not identify as having a disability yourself, you are probably connected to someone who has a disability. Um, so that inherently makes it, you know, uh, a, a, an issue near and dear to everybody's heart. Um, and it's not something that we need to shy away from. Um, the global, the purchasing power of people with disabilities around the world is estimated at $8 trillion. So also just from a marketing standpoint, the, the, the purchasing power of this target is just so large. It's the largest minority in the United States. Um, another part of this is um, the RO, you know, besides it being the right thing to do, which, you know, 
advocating for equity and inclusion for all marginalized people is what we're trying to do. But in addition to that, um, there is a business prerogative of this. Um, there isn't a report published a couple of years ago from Accenture partnered with Disability In and the American Association of People with Disabilities uh, that says that leading companies of disability inclusion stand to gain double the net income and a greater ROI. So this has just been an increasingly um, you know, wily, almost everybody is joining in. You know, it's, it's the right thing to do, it also makes business sense. In addition to that, there's a, a wide growth of d &I initiatives in general, and with that, the conversation of ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So um, this part of accessible marketing and accessible content strategy just goes into the, all of this on how you implement this correctly. Um, I will just briefly touch upon, you know, as we talk about accessible content marketing, this is just one, one small general take on everything. There's so much more to learn. So I encourage you all to keep diving in, learning more. Um, the more you know about it, the more you can incorporate it um, appropriately in your storytelling and your initiatives. Um, I will lastly talk about um, another point I want to add about disability to kind of set the foundation as we dive into this is um, disability is a mismatch between the person and their environment. Um, and it's not up to the person to uh, overcome those barriers. It is on society and all of us to make sure things are accessible and equal to everybody. So um, this falls in line with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities on how to build an equitable environment where people with disabilities can thrive. So um, just kind of looking at things through this equitable lens instead of like a charity or a medical lens, it's, it's really about um, driving equity. Um, John, do you want me to expand on anything else? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. I'd love to get some insights from from Sina just on like the practical application of digital accessibility, like in the content strategy that uh, you know nonprofit organizations might have around marketing, communications, fundraising, and just the general outreach that they're doing. So before I dive into that, I feel a need to touch on some research, some more about the why. Mm -hmm. um, the reason is, so my company and I, we did some research um, um, to understand the lived experience of people with sight, speech, hearing, and cognitive disabilities to understand their experience consuming content. And we surveyed 800 people in the United Kingdom in the United States. And we found how they consume content and how that impacts them. So I don't know if you've thought of it that you as an organization, whether you're a nonprofit or not, you are a brand and how you communicate impacts whether or not people are willing to support your cause, donate to your mission and um, support you as an organization. So when I mention a brand, I'm talking regardless of whether you're a corporation or not. So when we looked into this research, we realized that 40% of people with disabilities, when content is inaccessible, they will not purchase from the brand or recommend it to family and friends. And 81% said that inaccessible communications evoke negative emotions towards the brand. As a result, they're frustrated and disappointed with the brand, they feel less excited, and this as if the brand is unreliable. Conversely, we found that 60% of people said that they would purchase or purchase that brand over a comparable brand as well as recommend it to family and friends. This means that by doing so, you have a competitive advantage to other organizations who are participating in this crowded market to reach people. 
So um, what we've learned is by trying to do research and trying to understand how we can improve our content is by looking at what are the different, different ways that we can create content, trying to recognize that social media is a problem for so many. And what we've noticed is that by focusing on doing some simple things, making small practical steps, we can make the social media more accessible by adding alternative text for images, which is a brief description, so that people who are blind or partially sighted can access that information with their screen reader. That we use plain language to simplify what our message and to make it clear and come across in a way that's easy to consume. To use camel case hashtags, which involves capitalizing the first letter of each word so that a screen reader can access it. And that's just the beginning. There's so much that we can do. And it's a matter of developing it as a habit. And so we recognize that and we created the 21 day challenge that I mentioned earlier that shows you how to create a self description like the ones we did at the beginning of this meeting to make it an, an inclusive experience for individuals who are blind, partially sighted and neurodivergent. So there's so much that we can do and we found a way to simplify it and make it easy for you to integrate it into your content work streams. Um, is there anything more you'd like me to elaborate on, John? Thank you, Sina. That was beautiful. Yeah. And you you gave me a great segue into a, into one of the slides that I want to share in a minute. But before we go there, I'd love to, you know, ask Conrad, you know, given that you are, you know, working on the agency side, supporting like nonprofits, building websites and applications and functionality for nonprofits, what does it mean to be content accessible in your world? Um, <clears throat> so to be content accessible means you're following the law <laughs> for, for ADA, um, to touch on what kind of a uh, Elaine said. Um, it, this is a requirement. This is not an optional item. Um, so this is this does fall under ADA. Companies have been taken to court over this. So for us, it really means that number one, you have to do the absolute basics to get your site uh, ready and prepped and to follow that those those rules that starts at the very first communication with your agency or with your internal team and to say hey are we accessible if not we need to find out how to measure that and there's some really great tools to do that so creating that baseline it's almost a, a i'd consider it an internal kpi so what is your, where's your starting point? Where do you want to be for accessibility? To push it forward and to say, okay, if this is a, um, something that we had kind of briefly discussed offline uh, in, in our prep meeting was, you know, this is for us normally a bottom-up push to, uh, for companies. It's not been always a top-down approach saying we want to do this. We say, hey, this exists and you have to follow these rules. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. Uh, they don't understand that the web is fundamentally not largely uh, accessible um, for those with disabilities. And it's not been really reinforced in programming guides, in classroom and education uh, for the past 20 plus years. So that's kind of where we have to start. The really great sell of this, though, is the fact of not only do you see the monetary value, you know, with what Elaine and Sina have said, but you see the SEO value. The minute that you add descriptions to images, the way that you craft your copy into proper formatting of HTML, that you're following proper content guidelines, all plays extremely well into the hand of search engine accessibility to, and search engine rankings 
And these are very, very basic items to be able to do from the beginning of a site or to an analyze with a restructure, um, adding things such as ARIA labels to buttons, you know, a button that says next to gives no context uh, or click here, um, being able to provide descriptive labels uh, for those that can't see that do use a screen reader are really, really important uh, for that interaction. So that's what it really means for us to say, be content accessible. It starts with that very first conversation. It needs to be constantly brought up and then it needs to be measured to understand where things can be improved or uh, iterated on for maximum accessibility compliance. Thank you, Conrad. That's that's really fascinating. I wanted to um, share an example of uh, what I think is a good example of accessibility and content strategy and practice. Um, really interested in, in looking at organizations, nonprofit organizations, governmental organizations that are doing a really good job of this, whether it's on their website, whether it's through their social media. I have a really beautiful example um, that was done by NASA. So I'm going to try to share my screen and I will explain what's on the screen for everybody so you can understand what you're looking at here. Give me one second. Okay. So this is a slide. Um, it's from NASA's Twitter handle, which is that NASA. And it's a meaningful, descriptive, and thorough um, image description or an alt tag for a picture of Jupiter that they shared out on their social media handle. The tweet says, uh, giant news from a giant planet, exclamation point. At NASA Web, that's the Web telescope handle, captured a new view of Jupiter in infrared light, uncovering clues to the planet's inner life, two moons, rings and distant galaxies are visible. Get the details. And then there is a link to find out more. And below that is a square photograph of Jupiter. Um, it's a beautiful photograph. I wish I could make it bigger, but uh, I wanted to leave it small so that I could fit the image description next to it so we can read this. And I think if you didn't see the image, uh, and you read this image description, you would have a really good sense. This is a meaningful image description. It's a meaningful alt tag that describes this image. A wide field view showcases Jupiter in the upper right quadrant. The planet's swirling horizontal stripes are rendered in blues, browns, and cream. Electric blue auroras glow above Jupiter's north and south poles. A white glow emanates out from the auras. Along the planet's equator, rings glow in a faint white. These rings are one million times fainter than the planet itself, exclamation point. At the far left edge of the rings, a moon appears as a tiny white dot. This moon is only 12 miles, 20 kilometers across. Slightly further to the left, another moon about 100 miles or 150 kilometers across glows with tiny white diffraction spikes. The rest of the image is the blackness of space with faintly glowing white galaxies in the distance. And I wanted to share this because I think a lot of folks that work in nonprofits, folks who are managing websites, who are managing social media, you know, you know about image descriptions, you know about something like alt tags. A lot of content management systems have a field to hold that information when you post an image. But this is a meaningful image description that NASA has chosen to use. It's not so simple that it wouldn't be helpful. It's very descriptive. And I want to also mention this does take time to do this and do it well. You know, so one of the things we'd like to touch on with this webinar is to think about how can you build in the time to do more meaningful work around content accessibility. So I'll stop sharing my screen for a second here. So I wanted to pivot quickly to uh, talk about some of the innovations that have happened um, 
with accessibility and content accessibility that are now commonplace. Some of these things that have emerged from accessibility tools that you may not know about. So for instance, earbuds, right? Earbuds are something that you see everyone in the world uses earbuds walking around out in public. You may be using them right now to listen to this webinar. Captioning on videos, you know, that's something else that came from accessibility. Dark mode, which is something when I had my vision um, impairment uh, and something I still use today, even though I've regained some of my vision back, uh, having the ability to sort of control the readability and the contrast with dark mode on screen. So these are some examples, but I'd love to, you know, ask Sina, like, are there other examples that you know of that you would be willing to share around these innovations that we can learn from? Oh, absolutely. So the three that come to mind immediately is the typewriter, um, speech to text or voice recognition software, and audiobooks. So the typewriter was created in 1605 because an Italian inventor was trying to help his friend who was blind and could not handwrite letters. So he developed the typewriter to enable her to communicate by, by hand, by writing letters. And over time, the typewriter has advanced to the keyboard, which all of us have and use, whether it's on our cell phone or a laptop, it's ubiquitous. Um, the second one, as I mentioned, is speech to text. It's something that the software was developed in the 1990s um, with the intention of enabling people who could not physically write the ability to either physically or digitally, digitally put their thoughts on paper. And that has advanced significantly to the ability to use voice recognition. So when we're bossing Alexa around, we have voice recognition and speech text to thank for that, as well as being able to text while we're driving by telling um, the system what to, what to type for us. And the last one, as I mentioned, was audiobooks. Um, it was something that was created in 1932 by the American Foundation for the Blind to enable blind people to enjoy books and stories. And it started off as vinyls that could hold 15 minutes. And it has advanced to be quite commonplace. So many people listen to audiobooks in the car or as, as a way to limit their screen time. And as of 2020, in the year of 2020 alone, the market um, saw $1.3 billion in sales. And that's just talking about these three pieces of technology. There are so many more. And I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. Thank you, Sina. I was wondering, um, Conrad, if you had any thoughts around any type of accessibility things that have emerged from design and development that you could share? Um, from the design and development, probably the biggest one that we've seen is finally standards being put together, uh, which is referred to as WCAG, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And it's, it started out as kind of a way to get common elements um, in, a, in a form that are accessible and evolved now to kind of be the standard. Uh, it's constantly evolving. There are issues with it, especially with contrast ratios uh, of colors, but it's that's probably the biggest step that, that we've seen. And what that, what that means out of all the, the sites that we've designed and developed is, you know, years ago, a font size. Uh, we all remember typing on 
uh, keyboards and typewriters and, and such, then it was 12 point font was the standard for years. And now it's 16. Um, there have been different adjustments there. Same with uh, a, a, a huge one has been um, DPR, d device pixel uh, resolutions. So how sharp certain things now can function and look along with uh, the area that you can actually interact with with that. So what was great is um, when Apple first launched the iPhone uh, alongside that, they came out with the uh, hu human interface guidelines, which largely uh, took into account accessibility and accessibility mode was launched at that time as well. So it's always been a paired uh, item. And it's it's if you've ever broken your screen on your phone, you the way to access it is through accessibility. It's the first actually reason why I I got into accessibility for mobile um, was because of that, and I found it so fascinating and easy to to use from the the beginning. And it launched all these other thoughts of how do you generate content, how do you make things um, uh, very accessible from that standpoint. Um, so one of the other things I do want to touch on here is that when we talk about accessibility in, in web, there's often a negative connotation that it has to be static uh, or not as much flair as we would want to express in, in either telling an emotional story online or uh, you know, just representing a brand in, in the way that they want to be represented. And what I challenge there is saying, um, if you take a look at ADA compliance related to architecture, that has not halted really cool way out there, insane designs for buildings, houses, uh, structures. You can still do anything that you want from a design standpoint. And the same is true for web um, and mobile. Whatever you want to do can be done. It just has to be a talking point from the very beginning. Uh, so that's what we've seen as far as kind of the, this growth of, of, you know, the tools that are starting to, to be used, but also that it doesn't limit anything from creative or technology. Thank you, Conrad. I'd like to uh, pivot to something that I remember Elaine saying about how one in four people have a dis disability. And I wanted to get invite some audience uh, participation here. We're going to try to do a poll around, is your organization's content outreach inclusive of the one in four people who live with disabilities? Um, so we'd love to get your thoughts uh, and get some votes on this, see what people think. We've got three options here. Our content is not in, entirely accessible. Our content is accessible, but other forms of content are not. Our fundraising materials, website, email, social media, data visualizations, reports, and events are all accessible. I have a hunch that the third option is not going to get a lot of yeses. I'll give this a minute. And if anyone, if anyone is willing to share like some of the reasons why, uh, what are the common hurdles in your organization? If you're willing to share them in chat, that would be super helpful for us to look at and discuss. Great, we'll give folks another minute here. All right. Yeah, so it looks like 55% of the participants said our content is not consistently accessible. 38% of the participants said our website's accessible, but other forms of content are not. And 7% said our fundraising materials, website, email, social media, data visualizations, reports, and events are all accessible. 
and I, I see some great responses. You know, small organizations with folks who wear many hats, including in areas we're learning about as we go. For us, it's about awareness and training. Now that I've joined this organization, a big part of my job will be ensuring accessibility. And a lot of uh, comment about different departments that purchase online apps and software that do not meet standards, but our website leads to those and that puts us at risk. This is an area that our organization is learning about and I want our marketing team to help lead the transition. And this is a great start. So thank you all for sharing those stories with us. Hey, John, this is Elaine. Could I add something to accessibility and content strategy? Sure. Uh, so, you know, another thing as folks are trying to learn and figure out how, how to move forward with accessibility and marketing, Another thing I wanted to bring up is the use of multi-modes and uh, you know, leveraging reach across channels. So, I mean, this is something that you can do now without even having a big accessibility um, you know, knowledge or background. But again, thinking with a marketing hat on, it's you know, examining what is the channel you're using and can you complement that channel um, in a different way. So if you're using a podcast that is primarily auditory, can you have a visual element of that? Adding the podcast transcription with it. Or if it's primarily visual, say like a billboard, can you add um, you know, a different uh, mode to it, like a QR code? Um, so these things are just thinking of, of marketing strategy with accessibility in mind. And it doesn't really require, you know, to, to do that first step doesn't really require like, oh, what are the WCAG 2.2 guidelines or you know the web content accessibility guidelines. You can start to think about accessibility as multi-channels, multi-modes. Um, uh, I guess, you know, I think the same thing holds true in, in general marketing best practices. If you're going to try to reach a large audience or um, you know, what are the different channels you can use to make sure your audience receives your messages? So um, leveraging email marketing or social media, et cetera. Um, just wanted to throw that out there that uh, accessibility can also take, take that kind of format and approach. Thank you, Elaine. Sina, I was wondering if you would be willing to share some of the the report findings, like a summary of some of the report findings that you built in your digital inclusion report. Yes. Um, so another thing that we found in addition to the two pieces of the two key findings I mentioned earlier was that, um, so not only is social media difficult to use, about 20% of participants said that it is the most problematic media channel. And Unfortunately, assistive tools do not have the ability to fix the, fix the issues themselves. 54% of the participants said that they use assistive tools. And when speaking to them further, 64% said that they have trouble consuming the content. 30% attributed to the content, whereas 34 contributed to the tool. Um, sorry, I have it backwards. 34%, 30% said it was the tool and 34% said it was the content. This clearly illustrates where we have an opportunity to help. And as I said before, the assistive tools are good, but they can't always solve it independently. I personally use a screen reader and the screen reader is good, but if we don't include the alternative text. It's not accessible. My screen reader will just say image or it'll read a string of numbers and there's nothing that I can gain from that. There's nothing that a visually impaired screen reading user can understand. It's not going that image that you may have selected to reinforce your message will fall flat. And so that's something that I really encourage you to think about, to think about how can you add, can, how can you improve the content to make it more accessible? Um, 
there are simple ways to do it, simple ways to add clues, to make your videos more effective by adding closed captions, transcripts, and even audio description, which many people aren't aware of. It's a secondary audio narration that describes a video for people who are visually impaired. I'm starting to see more of it, and it's effective, at least from my perspective, personally. Thank you, yeah, Sina. All right, so my last question in this section, because I, I want to move into, I see some questions coming in the chat around resources to share around the different mediums and channels that we use. So I do want to allow enough time for that. But I also want to ask um, the, the panelists, especially Elaine and Conrad, what are some essential considerations that you can recommend for persuading leadership or executives at nonprofit mission-driven organizations, the value of ushering and content accessibility. Because I think that seems to be a big challenge in a lot of organizations is sort of making sure that there's that C-level empathy, right? And importance and priority um, provided to people that are building content and people that are writing emails and building websites and producing thought work and reports and data visualizations and so on. Elaine, would you like to start? Uh, sure. So uh, convincing leadership to do this can go in different ways. I mean, there's different ways to influence people in general. Um, my organization, Disability and we tried to leave with a carrot, not a stick. So showing ways that inclusion works. Uh, commending great examples of it, getting excited about accessibility and innovation. Um, I think that's the way to do it, to show the value proposition of being disability inclusive and accessible. Uh, you know, leading with a stick, it is, you know, as Conrad said, well, for example, if it's not accessible, it, it is a, not complying with the ADA, you know, especially your website. Um, that is a huge risk financially. Um, but in addition to that, there is a reputation risk. Um, you know, if you're, and that goes across any aspect of, of diversity, when you don't do it right, or you don't do it at all, then people can tell your stakeholders, and especially the people that you're trying to reach, or if you're fundraising, um, they can tell in, in authenticity. So, you know, I would encourage you to kind of examine what are the influencing factors that would help you make the case. Um, there are different levers you can pull. There is the business case, the ROI. There is the brand side of things with the reputation management. Um, there's also just societal pressure. Um, when Black Lives Matters happen, well, you know, the the murder of George Floyd, that sparked a huge conversation that was needed around social equity. And with that has been a conversation about disability equity and accessibility. And I think um, if, if you're not doing it now, it's, people are gonna start asking for it soon. So why not incorporate that into your practice now? Um, that's kind of very quick, high level. This is Conrad. And uh, I'll, I'll follow up on, on that. We definitely take the monetary approach when talking to customers, uh, especially C-suite that largely revolve around, you know, KPIs and how is this going to make our organization bigger? How are we going to get more funding? How are we going to impact more? All those are related. So this kind of even goes to simple A-B testing. Is It's a great way to start as well. Uh, if you don't have uh, accessible, truly built into your, your site or platform is use something like Optimizely or, or Google even has A-B testing built in with a, a tag manager and try out different headlines, try out sites with different descriptions and see what that metric is as far as performance. 
you truly have to set a, a baseline and a goal though, to be able to manage this. So I know a lot of nonprofits use either Blackboard, Convio, or Every Action for their donations, right? That's if, if you're looking at micro donations to build the organization versus large donors, making sure that your donation forms are end to ends that you can easily fill out and collect money is huge. And you know, to be very frank, every action does a very good job with this. Convio does not. So where are most platforms that we see and nonprofits moving towards? We've seen United Nations Foundation move to every action. We've seen Feeding America, which is moving to every action. I mean, these are massive orgs and massive amounts of money. So it pays to be accessible. It returns massive dividends. And it has to go through, you know, beyond the, the technical flags. It has to be rooted in content creation from that start. Building a website is logic. It's creating the content for it is creative and hard and maintaining that as well. Um, something else that keeps coming to mind and I keep forgetting to say when we're mentioning emails and sending out communications, there should always be two. There should be the nice designy version that you know might have 10 images in it and has the flair and everybody thinks it looks really great, but there needs to be a text version as well. Those can be sent identical and they're in parallel. So that way, when you receive an email, those that are visually impaired have the text only version that will read through properly with proper formatting. I mean, how many marketing emails do we get a day that, that just have nothing but images and none of them have alt tags. And I, I just get five images in a row that make an email that makes no sense. So making sure that there's these two versions of, which can be sent in parallel. I mean, even new Google uh, uh, Gmail accounts by default have images turned off because of tracking. Um, so having that is uh, really, really cool. And for people that are old school back in the nineties or eighties for, for communications, ASCII art and, and text art is, uh, you know, and formatting is, a, is creative into itself and can be really, really neat to, to showcase as well. Um, excuse me, John, this is Nina. Can I add something to this? Absolutely. Um, so um, referring back to Sean's point about how it's so important to make sure that your website is accessible as you're trying to connect with donors and other organizations is um, data shows that 73% of consumers will go to a website and leave it if it's not accessible and that 80% of consumers are willing to spend more with an organization that has accessibility built in to the websites. And in reference to leadership, how it's worked for us is we have recognized that it's important that there's clear moral imperative. And it was recognized by our CEO because joint CEO, because his father was deaf. So we've seen through firsthand how people with disabilities are excluded from communications. And the company's conversations with um, an accessibility evangelist from Microsoft in Europe showed them, showed the team that if we make the small incremental changes in the way we communicate, it's doable. That these that these accessibility tools are already out there. We just need to learn the simple, small ways to change what we're doing to make it inclusive, to bring pe these people with disabilities into the conversation. And so we created all these tools to show people how to take advantage of these opportunities and make the small changes. So thank you for letting me add that. Thank you, Sina. No, that's great. So I know we are running short on time. So I, I would like to move into the how section uh, of our presentation. And I wanted to share a screen that has some, uh, a slide that has some resources on it. Uh, 
this is by no means an exhaustive list of resources. This is just a, a different set of tools that you can look at, that you can review, that could help you get started. It can help you do things like write better alt tags. It can help you understand some of uh, the inclusive marketing needs and so on. I'll share my screen real quick and we'll talk about a few of these. We may not get, get to all of them, but I did want to make sure that we left everyone with some uh, places they could go after the webinar to, to take a look around and review some of these uh, valuable assets. Right. Okay. So these were some of the resources that uh, myself and the three panelists uh, put together. Um, like I said, they're not, it's not inclusive of everything. Um, I'd like to just share uh, down at the bottom here, we have Accessible Social. This is a toolkit that's been written by Alexa Heinrich. She's a graphic designer, I believe, at uh, St. Petersburg College in Florida. And she started putting together best practices for social media into a book format and essentially turned it into a full website. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you're a practitioner of social media. Um, there's a lot of great tool tips in there that apply not just to social, but just around doing things better and smarter so that your content can be more inclusive. Um, I also learned about Dolly, uh, which is now on its second version from Conrad. Um, I'd love to hear from Conrad about um, some of the ways that you think it could be used to help with accessibility. Sure. So if you're not familiar with Dolly or not seen kind of the, the hype that's happening right now in um, kind of the next generation of tech, what it is, is that it is a artificial intelligent way to generate images from text prompts, meaning that you describe an image and in about 60 seconds, it generates four images from that. And it has been trained with millions upon millions of pieces of data. This is probably the biggest leap in image generation technology that we've seen in easily a decade. Uh, I think it is going to propel the next evolution of the web in a very, very um, interesting uh, capacity. There's a few different services around beyond Dolly that that do this as well. Um, so there's uh, Google has there called Imogen. Uh, there's Mid Journey, which you might have heard of. Uh, there's now Stable Diffusion, and this is going to be an explodingly large part of the next uh, evolution of web. Why this is here in a resource is because you cannot, you don't start with an image. Traditionally, what we've had in the past with uh, image recognition is tags. We see an image, we run it through Amazon's recognition or uh, Google's image search, and it will return back what's in the image. If we see a picture of a dog sitting on the grass next to a sprinkler with a tennis ball, it's going to identify those objects with a certain level of certainty. But what it doesn't do is what we saw from what John shared with the NASA post, which is a much deeper description that has some emotional context to it, that has a lot more variability to the description um, of the image that makes it a, a reality uh, to, to us. So. Dali starts that process for us and that we need to describe everything that we want to see in an art style, where it is, what colors, uh, and it can be very, very creative. I think it is an amazing tool that will start to generate content from text prompts rather than uh, from finding an image and then having to describe something in it. I think it's a very, very great uh, utility there. And I think there's also some fun training sessions that could be uh, built around that as well uh, to really educate how alt text can be crafted. You know, take your existing alt text in an image, 
run it through a system like Dali and see what it generates and see if you can't improve that image to get something close to the quality of what you might have on your existing site or with uh, the descriptions. Um, that's It's a fun one. Right now, Dali is invite uh, only. It is in a, a beta, uh, but um, if you search Dali, it's a combination of Dali the painter and Wally uh, from Pixar. Uh, that's kind of a fun little fact there. But uh, search it on Twitter or uh, on Google, and you'll see what people are generating. There's even been a music video that uh, a friend of mine, Aza Roskin, made uh, just with taking the lyrics of the song, running those through prompts, and then animating them together. And it is stunning, absolutely stunning. Uh, so another great tool there that's uh, not, it, it's, it's accessibility adjacent, I'll put it that way. Thank you, Conrad. Well, we are almost at time and this the, there are a lot of different resources here to talk about. I was wondering if Elaine or Sina, if you had any, of, uh, any thoughts or recommendations specific about any of these resources that you'd like to share. Um, this is Sina, absolutely. Um, after thinking about it, I think I neglected to share the website that all the resources that I shared with you. Um, the, the, sorry, the website is accessible-communications.com and that's where you can find the research, the guidelines, the 21 day challenge, all of that's there. And after hearing what Conrad had said about Dolly, I'm very excited about it because it feels like it will open up an avenue for blind people to participate in communications um, by curating the images. And so I'm very excited. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I. I don't have too much to add uh, on the Disability In website, disabilityin.org. Um, we have included some communications related um, resources. We have a social media toolkit with video demos on how to input alt text because it differs from channel to channel. Um, that's very useful. And I think the uh, UN Disability Inclusive Communications Guidelines are really helpful. So I'll pass those two links to you, John, so you can include it in the wrap up for everybody. Thank you. So I'll add two extra links to this as well. So everyone will have a, a robust toolkit to work from. So, well, we are at time. So I want to thank um, the, the panelists for joining us. This has been a wonderful webinar. I Appreciate all of your insights and expertise. And thanks to all the folks that joined us. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.